This is House Planning Help, episode 124. Hello, I'm Ben Adam Smith, and this is the podcast for you if you're interested in self-build, because I'm exploring what houses we should be building in the 21st century and trying to break down the major roadblocks that may get in our way. Alongside this, I'm still trying to tackle my own project, trying to build an energy efficient home before I turn 40 this August. Quick update on that in a moment. And my guest in this session is Paul Newman, the self-build director at Potton. We're going to be hearing the story behind their SIPs Build Passive House. So my land quest, we're looking at two properties that are in probate at the moment. Interestingly, they both got an open day this coming Saturday and then bidding will take place on Monday. So this is a highest bids system, which I suppose is a good thing because you can see where you stand. Um, We've done a few checks beforehand, just looking into some of the issues with both of these properties because there always seems to be something to consider. For example, they're both in a conservation area. One is on a private road. There's a tree preservation order on one. So we've done a little bit of digging around, but the planning office seemed to think that both of these would be fairly easy to create the type of building that we want to build on it, which is good. So we'll see how we go on that next one. As I say, when it comes to the highest bids, I suppose the one downside of where we're at on these two is they're both at the upper end of our spectrum. More news to follow in subsequent podcasts. Let's move to our interview now. This is with Paul Newman from Potton. Few interesting things going on simultaneously here. They have a history of serving the self-build market. They also have a show center of completed houses in St. Neots. I always think this is a nice way just to experience what self-build could get you and to help you hone in on what exactly you want. They're currently building a passive house using Kingspan tech panels, so SIPs, and they've been putting on loads of events throughout this build, letting members of the public come to specific days to see elements of it as it goes through, which I really like. I think that's very informative and we'll hear about that. So let's get digging. First up, I asked Paul for some background on Potton's history. The Potton business was established in 1964. So this year we've been going 51 years. We celebrated our 50th birthday last year. And we produced our first self-build house back in 1981. And the prototype is actually still outside the factory gates, stood now being lived in by someone completely unrelated to the business. And I hope very much that they're enjoying the home. Since then, we've helped people design or we've designed and built over 6,000 self-build properties for our customers. And that originally started with a portfolio of 12 designs, but now has expanded and we've got a back catalogue of over 12,000 different designs that we've produced over the years. And these days, because of the way the marketplace is, we dip into that portfolio for about 50% of what we do and then modify it. But the other 50% is completely bespoke design. And that architectural flexibility is something that we've added over the past uh, 18 months or so. It's interesting. Going through my mind just then, I was thinking custom build, self build. So you actually, you cover quite a bit of ground. We do. For us, the boundaries between custom build and self build are are pretty blurry. And we're we're very active in the custom build market. It's, It's a fairly new, it's a very new market, still trying to define itself a bit. Our approach has been to try and stick fairly close to our core. So instead of creating designs for self-build customers and then securing their planning permission, making the building regs application and providing a a package of products and services to to those customers. On our, our approach to custom build is to work with landowners, generally family landowners, on an exclusive basis. And we secure outline planning permission on their sites for them with design left as a reserved matter. We then find customers for those sites who buy the land from the individual landowners, and then we work with them to provide our normal self-build package. It sounds complicated, but it's actually relatively simple. We want to talk about one specific project at the moment, which is the passive house. So can we begin? How often do you start to think about, oh, we should be doing something different, something new? We have at the moment four and a half show houses, I like to think, or five and a half show houses, in fact, because I always forget the one that we have down at Swindon in the National Self-Build and Renovation Centre. 
up in our St. Neot Centre, we have four fully furnished completed houses. The first three were built in 1992, or were opened in 90. The show centre was opened in 1992. Since that time, those houses have been refurbished a couple of times each, uh, more than a couple of times probably. And in fact, the most popular, the Granston Show House, was refurbished uh, last year. The market for self-build is is changing like most things increasingly rapidly. Four years ago, we took the decision to design and construct the last show house here, a Wickenbrook barn, and we constructed it to achieve level four of the Code for Sustainable Homes, which we thought at the time was a good target, a good performance level that was going to become very applicable to our customers Unfortunately, the government have somewhat reneged or have completely reneged on the Code for Sustainable Homes and it's now been ditched as a vehicle, which is a little bit frustrating. So probably about two years ago now, we thought, right, what can we do next? We really need to move ourselves on as a business and help our customers see something different. And we decided that we'd construct another show house and conceived or the idea came To me, I guess that if we were going to do something different and not just build another house, then Passive House was the obvious place to go. When you're doing this and knowing that the building is going to be repeated, you're going to have this on multiple sites. How does that affect what you're trying to create? Because you've mentioned about flexibility of of your products, but if you put this Passive House on different locations, what does that mean? I'm trying to untangle it in my head at the moment i'm not so sure and i'll uh, having said this i'll obviously be wrong i'm not so (laughs) sure that uh, this particular design will get repeated exactly as it is early indications are that some it's very much a marmite design and that's actually a deliberate thing we're getting people walk into it and go oh this is absolutely wonderful and equally uh, and we're still at the construction stage so they can't see that much Uh, equally we're having other people walking into it and going oh no, I really hate it. It's not for me at all. And that's absolutely fine. The aim was to challenge ourselves, to challenge our customers a little bit. So if it doesn't get repeated somewhere else, I'm not that worried about it. What I probably think will happen is people will take it as a base case and will evolve the design. We've certainly learned an awful lot during the process. And I guess we'll talk about that in a bit. And so we'll we'll evolve different design forms based on the passive house uh, but not necessarily repeat it let's look at the design then you've got your plot we don't have to worry about that because it's on the show home how did you begin to take things forward unusually for us what we decided to do was to work with an external architect's practice and we worked with hta design they're a practice that we've worked with extensively in the past on the volume contracting side of our business. They have long-standing interest in low energy homes, but are not worldwide or not renowned as passive house experts. Experts in low energy, yes, and sustainability, yes, but not in passive house. That suited us fine, actually. We trust each other as businesses implicitly. We've got a lot of history with each other. And for us, that meant they were a good choice. We did work with some specialist passive house experts who are based down in uh, Plymouth, who are probably pioneers in Passive House, who are pioneers in Passive House in the UK. So we went to them for little specialist bits of advice just to make sure that we were doing, if not the right thing, then acceptable things. What's the brief then, the size, the type of house you're trying to create? We gave the architects a brief. Um, We wanted a family home. We specified a size. I think we specified about 170 metres. We've actually gone over it somewhat. The house started growing and we probably followed a fairly normal private architectural commissioning route where we asked them to come up with three concept designs for us and then reviewed those, uh, went through them in some detail and picked one ultimately and developed it. The one we picked was probably the most complex of the three and sometimes on my darker days now I do worry that we picked you know we could have made life a lot simpler for ourselves than we have done um it's not a bad thing and it was something we deliberately set out to try and 
push the standard fairly hard to make sure that we broke away from um, Passive House has a little bit of a reputation as div- producing boxy designs, very simple boxy designs, which certainly do have a cert- or can have an architectural pleasing, can be pleasant on the eye, but are not always that way. Um, but we wanted to challenge and push that a bit. We've certainly done that. Um, and I have a few scars along the way to demonstrate it. It's always interesting because I want to build myself a passive house and I too hear that you're not really constrained. You've obviously got the points that you have to hit, the air tightness target, this, that, or the the energy demand. And yet it does sort of draw you towards making (laughs) simpler buildings, doesn't it? So this is intriguing. Maybe some of these lessons will unfold then. Okay, so we're we're underway. You've got the design that that you like. I mean, presumably you are thinking, well, we would like something that could be repeated. Yeah, it's one of the things that we were interested in. Could Would our customers repeat it? Could our customers repeat it? When we actually constructed the Wickenbrook, which was the fourth show house here, the barn to code for sustainable homes level four, we didn't really think that that would be repeated too many times or taken as a base case for people then to develop their own designs or develop further their designs from. But reality has proved somewhat different and sales of designs based on that are actually going really, really well. We'll find out what happens with a passive house design in due course, whether people build from that, whether they don't. I can see it being used as a base case and then people evolving things from that. Can we talk about the construction type? Uh, because I haven't actually visited many passive houses that have been built with SIPs. So this is quite interesting. It's interesting too, because my production company, Regen Media, did some of the filming and I actually saw that happen. So can you explain how it evolved? The Kingspan Tech building system, which is a structural insulated panel based building system, we've used that for about the past 10 years on our self-build side. We've been using it for about the same period of time as part of our volume contracting business. And we've used it there to construct a large number of low energy buildings and a very small number in comparison of passive house buildings. So the structural insulated panel system does have a track record of being used in passive house buildings. The Kingspan Tech system actually is certified by the Passive House Institute as well. So it is accepted as a building system that can be used. The Passive House standard actually is construction method agnostic. It doesn't really care how you build. For us, the choice was simple in that we wanted to use a high performance system, one that we know through experience that we can deliver very low levels of air tightness in. And so for us, that's why we chose the tech building system. What are the pros and cons then of structurally insulated panels? The pros are that you can build the structure very quickly on site. One of the pros that I don't think has yet properly come out into the marketplace is that because the bulk of the insulation is encapsulated within the panel, doesn't get subject to thermal bypass in the same way that fibrous insulations perhaps on masonry builds might do if the building is constructed not as not perhaps quite as well as it could do so it provides a thermally robust solution something that can go up quickly on site one of the downsides perhaps is that the system can have limitations in flexibility on site. You really don't want to be changing your mind about what a room shape is going to be once you're on site. You need to do all of that sort of work at the design stage. And I guess that's something that you take into account because you know you're dealing with SIPs. In terms of the other elements, this was obviously working with HTA. I mean, how did you source all of the uh, various products that you were going to need in order to achieve Passive House? When we build a new show house, we talk to partners in the supply chain and see what new products they've got coming up, coming forward. And we see if we can incorporate those into the build for them in return for a little bit of financial support. Uh, in terms of free product, basically. So it's really a matter of looking around what's new 
In this case, at the moment, also we decided to see what we could get from uh, our parent company, Kingspan Insulation. So where possible, those products have been incorporated into the build. We've worked closely with our window partners at Clover, and Passive House is a new venture for them as well. And they brought uh, to us a Passive House certified window, which was a new thing, a good thing. And we've also worked with uh, other long-standing partners to provide servicing solutions. So with Total Environment Homes for the MVHR and the hot water services in the building and with our kitchen partners at Callerton. Let's switch this over slightly because... This has been part of Self Build Live, which is a series of events that you have put on. And I think this is very interesting because not many people have this opportunity to go and take a look at a build multiple times, really, as it progresses. So how has that gone down, really? Self Build Live was a quite a new concept for us. I think probably a fairly new concept for the marketplace. When we built the, the uh, barn to Code Level 4, we did open up the build at uh, a few stages but they were very predefined very uh, also very limited in nature we didn't particularly publicize them that well so consequently the take-up wasn't very good for self-build live for the passive house build we've publicized it much more effectively it's been marketed very well uh, we've run a website along it and we've had had yourself come along to film it on a few occasions as well that's been good we've had a particularly good response to it what we're finding is that some there's a lot of people who are actually just interested in the building process so i want to come and see how a house is built and for them the fact that it's a passive house is almost an irrelevance they're coming to see a build coming to go onto a building site and it's allaying some of the fears that they might have about the whole process for others it really is about the passive house nature of the build and there are definitely some people who are multiple visitors and I'm glad to say that some of those are now turning into customers for us. But there are also some people who come along multiple times who are most definitely not going to be building with us. And that's actually fine as well. We're quite happy with that. It was something we always accepted and knew was going to happen. And we hope that those people have learned something about the process from coming to see us. Well, you put on some really interesting talks and education courses, um, which I know that, uh, again, connected in with the video side here, I've, I've been impressed that you put on that. So it might be worth explaining in case anyone wants to come and see one of these. We, for our 50th birthday, actually, we decided, which was back in 2014, I guess now, we decided to launch something called the Self Build Academy. And the self build academy aims to take people in a fairly non-partisan way through the entire self build process from uh, how to find a plot of land how to work out whether the piece of land you found is indeed a plot take it all the way through to how to manage and start your build on site um, and how to finish things off on site so at every part of the stage of self build there is we've aimed to develop some educational material that provides self builders with what they need some of it's fairly light touch we operate some uh, coffee mornings really which are we call networking events but they really are a glorified coffee morning with a 20 minute or half hour talk and then about two and a half hours of questions and networking and cake and tea and coffee. And that works really well. Some of them are more information transfer seminar type situations. Then the uh, on-site related courses don't quite have an exam at the end of them, but are pretty intensive. Two days, sit down around the table, a small number of people and go through every step of the build in quite some detail. I wouldn't say that we've quite finished or developed a complete portfolio yet, but we're getting there. We get, we've added more material progressively um, and probably by the end of this year, we'll have what I consider a complete portfolio and then we'll be just trying to refine and improve the course material. Does this actually help self-builders? And I talk as someone who's trying to be a self-builder, or do you just find that they get stuck in this, oh, I can't find land, or oh, I can't finance this? The I can't find land question, we've really tried, we're very much aware our, our livelihood depends on self-build customers finding a plot of land that they can then subsequently get planning permission on. And it's a little bit embarrassing that it's taken us 
almost 30 or 30 odd years to 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 come to that uh, realization and do something about it two of the key courses actually are how to find a plot of land and how to appraise a plot of land the how to appraise a plot of land course goes into quite some technical detail about what's a plot what's not a plot what is going to remain a field forever or for a long 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 time and is therefore not worth buying and to accompany that course we publish um, free of charge to everyone that comes a little guidance document that says uh, how to appraise your plot so those two courses have been quite critical in helping our customers or potential customers uh, find plots of land. And again, the the Self-Build Academy is open to everyone. So you don't have to be a Potton customer or or even consider yourself a potential Potton customer to come along. They're free to all. Let's get back to the passive house. And you mentioned that this has been a learning experience. So can we go through some of those things that you feel that you've learned? (laughs) If you can remember them. Uh, Yeah, I can remember some of them all too well. What we've done is we've come up with a building form that's quite complicated. We started with a a rectangular box and then allowed the architects to cut chunks out of it. Um, And whilst that's, we've ended up with a design that's pleasing. It's got a lot of junctions in it. Um, We've got a valley roof as well. So from a thermal bridging perspective, those junctions have actually been pretty tricky to resolve and to get them to be thermal bridge free and we've worked very hard at that uh, with our supply chain partners and have got there but it's a simpler building form certainly would have helped with that one of the other key things you you don't really notice until you perhaps get upstairs in the building is that whilst it's a two-story house and because its roofs are primarily monopitch it's actually lower than the two-story house next door which is not one of ours on the neighboring plot When you go into the first story rooms, typically bedrooms, they are, um, there's an awful lot of head height in there and the windows on that first floor are awfully tall and we would have made life a whole bunch easier if we'd lopped off 18 inches off of the build. But that's something we didn't realise until I stood in it one day and thought, blimey, it's a bit taller. These things you learn as you go through. You know, there are some good things as well. We've used a, a, an innovative self-adhesive uh, breathable membrane on the build, and that's contributing very positively to our air tightness. And we found the air tightness target of 0.6 not too difficult to achieve. Our first test, actually, is no secrets. We pulled uh, from memory 0.68, and then after a little bit of messing around, uh, which took about an hour in total and found some schoolboy errors. And um, we got that down to 0.6, did a smoke test, and then did an air tightness test again in public and actually pulled the 0.5 figure. Obviously, a lot of these are refining the design. So um, I'm interested too in the roof light that you have. Do you have any concerns about overheating or? Overheating was something that was an issue at the early stages of the design. Um, when when you're designing a passive house, or one of the things we've learned is that when you're designing a passive house, you should start modelling from day one to see how the building is performing in the PHPP model, the passive house planning package. One of the things that at the early stages showed up was that the building did have more than a, 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 desir- a tendency, a little bit more than was desirable to overheat. So we played around a bit with overhangs and reveal depths. And critically, well, the one thing that we found made a massive difference was very carefully specifying the uh, gl- performance of the glazed units within the windows. And actually now, I can't remember the specific number, but the building has theoretically against the PHPP model has very little tendency to overheat. Time will tell whether whether it's right, of course, or not. The windows have been installed mostly during winter period, so we haven't had huge long periods of uh, sunlight. But so far, it's remained um, plenty cool inside, and that's with it being airtight and without any ventilation. Are there any other lessons that you feel that you've learnt on this project? I think for us, there are probably two major lessons. One is in engaging really early with the supply chain to make sure that they understand 
uh, what you're trying to achieve, that they have the right products available, um, and that for the key product elements, they have the appropriate certifications in place. We did try and engage early, but the lesson has been we should have engaged earlier and should have got some of our orders placed earlier. That's our own fault, and um, that lesson's well and truly learned. The other one is that we chose to work fairly sensibly with uh, subcontractors who we were familiar with, subcontractors who've worked on hundreds of pot and houses in the past. And we really did find that we had to hold their hands very tightly in terms of what was required uh, with regard to passive house performance and just the quality of uh, construction work that's necessary to achieve that. That's not something that's going to be unique to us. That's something that everyone is going to experience there. At the moment, there simply are not enough passive house experienced subcontractors out there, particularly in the self-built sector. And for the standard to grow um, and for construction costs to drop then that really is something that is going to have to change let's tie this all up then i'm particularly interested you talked about people who'd been coming and having a look around that first group of people who just wanted to see a house built did passive house even leave a mark on them or do you think that they just want to build a house still you know what is that permeation like What we're finding at the moment is that when you mention Passive House to potential customers, they get very excited about it. And for some of those people, that excitement maintains. It's something they want to follow through on and they definitely want to build one. Um, But there are other people in there who, when you explain it to them in a little bit more detail, start to back off just a little bit and say, Oh, I'm, I'm interested in energy efficiency, but what I really want is just an energy efficient house. I'm um, interested in not having big fuel bills in the future, but I think passive house might be a commitment too far for me. And what I think we have now done is work out one or two step back points from a full on passive house specification to try and meet the needs of customers who want to build low energy who want some security over their fuel bills in the future but are not able to commit themselves or are unwilling to commit themselves to a full-on uh, passive house build what we must do for them is to make sure that any step back points we offer are coherent when this building is complete it's going to be the first passive house show house in the uk People might have had opportunities to visit friends if they'd known or to go via the Passive House Trust. But that's quite an interesting position. You might find people seeking you out. So does this change your business at all or is it just business as normal? I think perhaps, Ben, we don't really know the answer to that question yet. Uh, Time will tell. But I think that we will see an increasing number of people interested in very low energy homes and the passive house standard in particular. We know from our experience over the past eight years that we're getting asked more and more about energy efficiency and cost of running a home over its lifetime than we ever were in the past. So for a lot of people, the emphasis is shifting. They're still very much interested in good design and having the home that looks right and fulfills their needs. But now the focus is shifting again to energy efficiency. So I think we'll see a a gradual change and hope very much that the Passive House and what we've learned from it will uh, put us in good place for years to come. Well, Paul, I really appreciate your time today. It's been really interesting to learn about the house, and I know we're going to link up all of those videos and the website that's full of information too. So thank you very much. Thank you, Ben. Head online to take a look at the show notes that accompany this session at houseplanninghelp.com slash 124. You can review the key points. Also take a look at some visualizations of the house and some photos of the house as it's progressed on site. We've mentioned the videos as well. All the links that we've talked about, in fact, you will find. Let's give you this address once again, houseplanninghelp.com slash 124. A quick hub update, and then we're going to finish for today. The hub is our premium resource, and what we try to do in there, we've got two elements. We've got the learning side and also the community side. So bringing together people who are serious about this, who want to build a house, 
all at different stages, just like-minded people and the learning elements. Let me tell you about the module that we've added this month. I wanted to get doing this one early on rather than later because it's the Getting Started module. And this is a logical sequence of what it takes to build a house. We've tied together all the best thoughts from various interviews that we've heard and just packaged it up so that hopefully you're going to get through this in a really easy way or at least get your research underway so that you're in a good position. We've also got our case study, Long Barrow, the passive house build that continues and currently they're putting up the steel frame. So we're going to find out why they need a steel frame. Also, what they have to be careful of this thermal bridging elements because they want to attach a balcony and a breeze soleil as well. However, the actual steel frame putting it up only took five hours. So you can watch the latest video there and find out more. All this, we're putting in full access at £45 for the year. That price is going to go up soon. Find out more, houseplanninghelp.com slash hub. That's everything for today. Thank you for being there. As ever, always enjoy your company. The House Planning Help podcast is produced by Regen Media, content that matters.